Today we get to uh, celebrate the Lord's Supper, as you can see in front of me. We get to, uh, to, to continue to sing and praise God, as we heard it already at the beginning of that. And we get to enjoy some fellowship together uh, during our worship service, which we'll do in just a minute. I want to first of all welcome our first time guests. Thank you for being here. If you've never done this before, please uh, be sure to fill out our connection cards. They're found in the pews in front of you. Put it in our collection plate in a few minutes. That'll pass by. I want to send you a letter to thank you for being here and give you some information about our church. Um, we've got a, a lot of things coming up this coming month. We've got some things happening with men. We've got a, a conference in a few weeks. So, uh, definitely want you to be involved in that. We've got Trump and Tree still happening. Attention all men. I repeat, attention all men. 
And by that statistic, our greater brothers not to come to some of our battles. Be a force for change and help your family to be for not be for battle. This conference will not only help you, but will equip you with the tools to talk about tough issues with your sons, grandsons, and all men in your family. It's all happening on Friday and Saturday, October 10th and 11th. The cost is $29 and scholarships are available. Be a part of the solution in your home. Join my sign up at the Welcome Center today. That's all happening at the First Baptist. Don't do it again. 
wait, see the symbols, and then talk to me at the end of the service. And let's talk about your salvation. If you have a child with you that has not yet received Christ, has not confessed the faith in Jesus Christ, don't give it to them because they want to sin or something like that. Use it as a teaching tool to show them what it means for Jesus to have been broken for us, for him to have shed his blood for us. And use it as a teaching tool to share the love of Jesus Christ with him or her. So for this reason, if there's a child that you have with you that is not taking the Lord's Supper, go ahead and pass over them. And you might hurt the feelings for a minute. But pass over them and talk to them. And if your neighbors care about that, well, shame on them, because you're teaching your child. Amen? Amen. I'm going to ask our deacons to uncover the elements as they do that. I'm going to go ahead and pray for us as we get ready to take this in the song. And especially. Amen. What a wonderful symbol we have. And remember to Jesus. Let's take this in a moment. So in the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Again, this is a symbol. This is a remembrance, this is a celebration, this is juice that shows us and tells us about the blood that Jesus had shed so that we can be forgiven of our sins. These cups have it. Uh, I'm going to ask y'all to hold on to them just for a moment. I'm going to do something totally different. Totally different. If we have any children that are not in the cup right now, I'm children. Come on, guys. I looked out there and I saw a bunch of long faces as these cups were passing them over. <laughs> you guys, I want you to get a really close look at this, okay? You guys see it? Okay. Now, what? Somebody tell me, what, what's in these cups? Anybody know what's in these cups? What's in these cups? And um, and you've already heard me say it. What does the great juice mean? Anybody know what the great juice means? Yeah, it represents represents the blood of Jesus Christ. Is it really the blood of Jesus? No, it's not really the blood of Jesus. Is it? It's a it's a symbol. Now, can somebody tell me what a symbol is? What's a symbol?
But he answered and said to his father, Look, for so many years I've been serving you, and I have never neglected the command of yours. And yet you have never given me a young goat, so that I might celebrate with my friends. But when the son of yours came, who has devoured your wealth of prostitutes, you have killed the fat and calf for him. And he said to him, Son, you've always been with me, and all that is mine is yours. But we have to celebrate, we have to celebrate and rejoice, for this brother of yours was dead and has begun to live and was lost and has been found. I find this particular verse very convicting. I have a wonderful little book I use every now and then. It's actually a book of common worship. It has some written prayers in it, but sometimes it's just so rich and beautiful. And I found one. They said that they're archaic, but it is so beautiful, so bear with me to put some of the words a little bit. In fact, it's in a place in this book called uh, Special Graces. And this particular one is actually for joy and others' happiness. So it's good short. Joy means prayer. Oh God, the wind of whose spirit bloweth where it listed, and whose rain falleth where it will. Quicken our ears to hear and our eyes to see the signs of thy presence, not only where our heads and inventions expect them, but wherever thy bounty bestows them. So shall our lives be gladdened by every miracle of grace, and our wills be alert to praise thy goodness to every creature. For his name's sake, who was born of the Spirit, the only Savior of the world. Amen. Amen.
said, well, it's just like an elevator. We'll just have to move over and make room for <laughs> So praise the Lord. But bring your friends to, uh, to Sunday school, bring the church. Next week is the week. Amen? So let's get you to do that. And uh, offer or not, in our view. That's the whole idea. Now, go to the Bible to Luke chapter 15. We are going to talk about the prodigal son uh, next week. Many of you already know the story of it. Uh, I'll tell you in a brief in just a moment. But, but really, what I really want to focus on is not that son who we know about who went away, but the other brother, the good brother. Years ago, when I was a preteen, uh, maybe even a, a older child, maybe a, a ten-year-old, maybe, I don't remember exactly not how old I was at that time, um, that that that, and that happened, but I remember writing back to my parents from Matt. From church, and, and I was raised Catholic, as many of you know. I was Italian. I am still Italian, but I was Catholic, <laughs> and uh, and so uh, so I remember going to mass and coming back. And my brother, who was always the one who would always blaze the trail for me, I always liked that about my brother. He's the one who got the lick and I got to keep on it. <laughs> and so uh, he would always do the stupid things, and I'd be able to slide in there and kind of slide on by. You know? But I remember my brother. In the car, on the way home, my brother said, you know what I think I'm going to be? And my dad said, what? He said, I think I'm going to be a Baptist. <laughs> I kid you not, my brother said that. That is an honest to God. My mom said, no! Get fed 
by working for him. I'm going to go back, and I'm going to say to my dad, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight, and I'm no longer worthy to be called your son, so make me one of your hired men. Verse 20 he says, He got up and came to his father, and while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion for him, and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And a son said when he started to say when he was rehearsed, and the father stopped and said to the slaves, Bring the best robe, put it on him, put a ring on his hand, sandals on his feet, bring the fat cake, calf, kill it, let us eat and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead, and he has come to life. He was lost and has been found. And they began to celebrate. What a great story that is. A young man who took off and did the worst thing possible to that again next week we talk more about it. the worst thing possible that he could have done as a young Jewish boy to, to, to leave his father's estate and to spend a loose living and to find himself in trouble. Not only did he find trouble, trouble found him. But he comes back and we have this great story of redemption and hope. Amen? But then we go to the second part of this in church. This second part of this, like what man did. This one really is convicting to me. I hope it's convicting to you. Because this good brother, the older son, he came and he started getting to the house. And as he got closer to the house, he heard music and dancing. And he started asking the servants, he said, what is this all about? And they said, well, your long lost brother basically has come. And your father decided he's going to go ahead and kill the fat and calf, the special calf, because he's now receiving that safe and sound. Now this made that good son angry when he would go inside the, uh, the, the place where they were partying at. And his father then took it upon himself to go out to the son. By the way, that was a big deal in Jewish culture. The father would never have gone out to the son. But he already demonstrated that with the first son. And he's also demonstrating his love for his good son by doing the same. Coming out and humbling himself enough to go from where he is to where he needs to be is a big deal. But he goes and he's pleading with him. And the son says to his father, he says, he says, Father, I have never stopped being in, in the, the Greek actually says, being your slave and being enslaved to you. And the NASB says, for many years I've never stopped serving you, never neglected a command of yours. You haven't ever given me a young goat. So I can celebrate with my friends, but now this son of yours came and, and he, he devoured your wealth of prostitutes and you killed a fat calf with him. And he said to him, the father, son, you've always been with me and all this time is yours. We had to celebrate and rejoice. For this brother of yours was dead and begun to live, was lost and has been found. The same words he used to the servants when they started the party. It's so convicting. Because the good son became a self-righteous son. A self-righteous good son who did everything but the books and deserved everything that he got. In church, if we're going to be honest with ourselves, sometimes we get into the church and we get to church and we start thinking that we are something and we're not. We get a little self-righteous of how we act and think and how self-righteous we are when we compare ourselves to others. And our self-righteous thinking begins to permeate not just our words and our hearts, but our attitudes and our actions. And we can get downright angry and even snobbish when it comes to people who don't know Jesus Christ as Savior. So today this is for you. And let me pray for myself. Today, this is for me. Maybe you'll get the overflow. How to cure self-righteous thinking. You got a slide up there? How to cure self-righteous thinking. The first thing you're going to see that we have here is a principle. And if you're following along in your, in your, uh, in your notes there, you've got it here or you've got it online, uh, you can go ahead and start filling in. The first blank is thinking. The, the first thing we're going to do, and I'm going to go through these fairly quickly, is to compare when you start getting a little self-righteous and start getting a little arrogant and start getting a little critical and a little uh, prideful is begin to compare your righteousness to God's righteousness. You see, the issue here is of how you view your own righteousness. When the son approached the house and he heard the singing and the dancing and the music and he saw him and he began to ask about this, he got upset because some went reason for some, in some way in his mind, he thought that things were just.
just unfair. How dare he love his brother who went and squandered his money? How dare he? He gave the very best that he had for his son when, when I'm here, he didn't do anything for me. He was upset. He got a little self-righteous there. He started thinking it better of himself than he ought to think. Look, when you start comparing your righteousness to others' righteousness, you get in real trouble. When you start thinking that you are better than the other guy, boy, you have some problems. If you start thinking that, that you know, well, I'm no church, you know what? He has a good church. Oh, look at God. I see him get his 12 pack of uh, a 24 pack case of bush beer every day. Every day. start to bury yourself in that person you're in trouble. Because you have now started to assume the, your, your own righteousness is better than that person when your righteousness is not your own to is Jesus Christ. He has purchased for you a way to get to heaven. You didn't do that at all. He did it for you. He just said yes. Amen. You compare your righteousness to God's and it changes the way that you think about people who need Jesus Christ. If you go to Luke chapter 18, take a look at this for a minute. Go to your Bible. Turn your Bible over. Say, ah ha ha ha. All right. Go to Luke chapter 18, look at verse number 9. You see a story. Some of you have a subheading of the Pharisee and the publican. You remember the story. Some of you do. Two men went into the temple of prayer. One was a Pharisee, a religious leader, and the other was a the Pharisee's son was praying this to himself. God, I thank you that I am not like the other people. Swindlers, unjust, adulterers, even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I pay my tithes and all I get. But the tax collector, standing some distance away, was not even unwilling to lift his eyes to heaven, but was beating his chest and breast, saying, God, be merciful. He thought his righteousness was his own. God, thank you that I'm not like this lousy, sickly tax collector. The tax collector wouldn't even look up, was sorrowful, and was careful, and was prayerful, and was humble before God. We see another story right after uh, that, where they were bringing the babies to the disciples began to rebuke them. And he said, What well, are the children doing? For there is the kingdom of heaven that belongs to them. What's he saying there? They are The next section, you have this rich young ruler. Oh, such an impressive guy. You know, generous guy keeps his commands. Imagine that. This guy has got a suit on, probably, in today's day. This guy has got socks on, brother. You got socks on? No <laughs> socks on. It's okay. I'm not saying better than you. But you know, whether you have socks or whether you have a suit, or whether you're standing before people or whether you're, you know, sitting here and listening, it doesn't matter. We're all on the same plane. We all have sin in our life. This rich young ruler went up to Jesus and said, What should I do? You know, eternal life. And, and Jesus said, You know the commandments? And then Luke, he says that the young man said, They have all these things I kept from my youth. Jesus gave him something else that said, sell all your possessions and give it to the poor and then come and follow me. And this young man walked away sad, verse 23, very sad, for he was extremely rich. Three examples of people who were prideful, in this case the Pharisee, the disciples who were stopping the children from coming to Jesus, and a rich young ruler, and three examples that Jesus said, don't be like them. Then you see at 18, the rest of 18, and you see in 90, the opposite, where you see Bartimaeus, the blind guy, who says, Son of David, have mercy on me. Or you see Zacchaeus in chapter 19, who was this horrible, terrible guy who made 
saw that they were righteous and few others were condemned. Paul wrote to Romans chapter 12, verse number 3. Listen to what he says. Through the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think more highly of himself than he ought to think, but to think so as to have sound judgments, as God has allotted to each of man to measure of faith. C.S. Lewis says, pride always means enmity, not only enmity between man and man, but enmity between man and God. The good brother fell into a trap of self-righteousness. He looked horizontally at his brother and he kept score. And he said, I'm ahead of him, and as long as I'm ahead of him, I'm okay. How many of us do the same thing when we look at others and say, well, at least I'm not that guy? Compare your righteousness to God in the past second. Consider your accomplishments as rubbish. You see, the inner lawyer inside this, this older brother, this, this good son, the inner lawyer, and you know what I mean when I say inner lawyer? He's starting to defend himself. He's starting to make up his case inside of his head. He's already got a case made, and he begins to say um, um, to himself and to his father, he says, look, I've been doing this, I've been doing this, I've been doing this, I've been doing this, and you haven't even given me a ghost. What did he do? He had constructed inside of his mind a whole system Argument, whatever you want to call it, of how he's going to answer his father because his father did something wrong somehow by, by celebrating the lostness of the son and the return of the son instead of him. And he started keeping score of his accomplishments and saying, These are the good things that I've done. He says, I've been serving you, I've never neglected the command of yours. They're great. Those accomplishments are great. We want some. We want to do that, but that's not, this is what Jesus is saying, that's not what is ultimately important. Relationships are important, not stuff. You see, the older brother had a wrong idea of what it meant to be a son. Being a son doesn't mean that you're going to be enslaved and work for your, for your rewards. When we come into the kingdom of Christ, we are not doulos, which is a Greek word for slaves, and that's the word that Luke uses. We, don't, we are not slaves to the Father. We are willing bond slaves to the Father, meaning we give everything up, not just our stuff, but our lives. And God doesn't love you anymore because you give up more, or loves you any less because you do less. He loves you because you came to him because you love his son Jesus. Bible said, states the opposite of what the older brother had thought. The Bible says this in Philippians chapter 3 and verse 7. It says this, Paul, whatever things are gained to me, those things I've counted as lost for the sake of Christ. More than that, I count all things to be lost in view of it. So passing the value of Jesus Christ, of knowing Jesus Christ my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them but as but rubbish. So that I may gain Christ. We're to place relationships ahead of the stuff we got. First John 3 says, This is the message that you've heard from the beginning, that we are to love one another. Your work means nothing without love. In fact, your relationship with God and people is founded on love. And so you need to understand that it begins and it ends with love. The son, the older son, thought of himself he had to do with all the stuff he did. And that's for his faithfulness and continuing to work for his way and work for his father. But his father says, it doesn't matter if you work for me or not. And, and trust me, he wanted a son that wanted to work. But he really wanted to see the son have a heart that was changed for him. In the same way, God our Father wants your heart to be changed for him. I want you to know this. You cannot, when you come to God, be disowned by God if you are truly His. Any more than you can legitimately ever be disowned by your parents. I know parents give them custody of kids, blah, 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 I know that. But what I mean by that is, your mother is still your biological mother, your father is still your biological father. You're not going to ever change that. You can say, well, I deny my father, I deny my mother. Okay, you can deny all you want. The truth is, you still have your genes in the DNA, right? You still have that. You can't legitimately break that bond. God has joined you together in faith with him. You cannot break that if you are truly his. And so you've got to remember that my accomplishments are good and they, they, they honor God, they glorify God, but ultimately, if I rely on my accomplishments, they are rubbish. They're junk. I ran a uh, 5K yesterday, and, and um, I was really happy. My time was the best time I've ever done. I was really happy. 
excited about that. And I ran it, and um, and I, I finished it. And the first thing when I crossed the line is they gave me a medal. Cool. It's a metal medal, too. It's not a plastic medal. It's, you know, it's a metal, not a hard medal. It's a metal medal. Okay? And that's really cool. But I got multiple medals from finishing, by the way. Not because I was some great runner, but uh, you get one when you finish, okay? You get one so that you didn't pass out on the way to the finish line, okay? <laughs> so I crossed the finish line and gave me a medal. That's great. I have no idea what I did. It is somewhere I got it. I, I know. And why is it that I don't know what I did? Because I really don't about the medal. It's rubbish. What really matters to me is running the race. Church. What matters to you should be that you run the race. And, and, and how you are treated by God does not matter because ultimately you're going to be with Him forever in paradise. So right now, you may have good times, you may have bad times. You may have rich times, you may have poor times. You may have well times, you may have sick times. You have happy times, joyful times, and you have some not so joyful times. But as you run the race, God is always with you, and you always have the hope that's in the future, the hope that we've been singing about, the hope that we know that it's Christ alone, that Christ one day will be honored and glorified, and we will be singing praises to him, to God in the Lord. Leon Morris wrote this about the old brother. He said, the proud and the self-righteous always feel that they are not treated as well as they deserve. In fact, Morris points out that this son, the older brother, even couldn't refer to the prodigal as his brother, but instead he said to the father, this son of yours. He rejected the relationship and tried to accomplish something, and God says, consider your accomplishments as rubbish. Ways to cure self-righteousness. Compare your righteousness to God's, consider your accomplishments as rubbish. Third, cherish your value to God. Like I just said, your value to God is not based on your works. Your value is based on the love of God. In the same way, your, the, the son here, we see the same thing. His, he, it's not always going to be based on that. Now, look at what the father says to the son. When he came out and humiliated himself by coming to his older son, he was like, if you know anything for a father to do in that particular setting, in that particular culture, but look what he says in verse 31. Put your finger on 31. You got your finger on it and say,
and repent of your self-righteousness. Compare your righteousness to God's, consider your accomplishments as rubbish, cherish your value to God, and last but not least, and most importantly, as you are looking around, celebrate the life changing others. What did the old brother miss? He missed the life change that happened. He was so busy getting angry about himself, the father again reframed him correctly. And he said, Look, you've always been with me, all that is mine is yours. But this brother of yours was lost, and now he's come back. Look what he says, verse number two. Key words. Get your fingers on 32, say, Uh huh, uh huh. Thank you. 
because we want everyone to come, say it with me, grow, serve, and share. There's none righteous, no, not one. And it crosses level the playing field for us. And I am a sinner, and you are a sinner, and we're all sinners. And when we realize our lostness, when we are walking contrary to what God says in the Bible, and they turn, and they, they come to Christ, and they repent, we should celebrate, we should embrace them, we should let the past be the past, and let's look for a future of Christ, and welcome them. Almighty God. In just a minute, I'm going to ask you to come out of your seats and pray and to kneel in the front and pray for that person that you have popped in your head. Pray for the bold courage to even just mention, hey, listen, we got this great event. We want you to come to church this Sunday. Don't do it when they're very happy, but do it when the time is right. And I want you to pray for the time. Don't be stuck in self-righteousness because that is against the gospel of Jesus Christ. Pride is the enemy of love. Self-righteousness is the enemy of the gospel. Instead, 